Amnesia the Bunker is absolutely terrifying. Hello? It's amnesia, but instead of a face cam of PewDiePie or Markiplier in the corner, you have a gat, and you can shoot rats. It also has a really deep survival horror layer, where you have to decide between using petrol to fuel the generator keeping the bunker's lights on, or drinking it. However, the true horror in this game lies in one simple fact. You are French. Amnesia the Bunker begins with you in a battlefield. The game takes place in World War 1, which is a reference to Battlefield 1. The the first thing you will notice that sets this apart from the previous Amnesia games is that you got a gat. Usually your only form of self-defense in this franchise is to just close your eyes. Kind of like when you walk past someone urinating on the side of the road. Of course, in order to use your gat, you have to load it with ammo. It's got a similar system to that King Kong game, where there is no visible ammo counter and you have to press a button to manually check. The best part of Amnesia has carried over, which is where you open doors by manipulating them physically. However, this time you can use the innovative technology known as the brick. The game's opening involves you running through these trenches while German people run around on top and shoot at you. Eventually some nice fella called Lambert comes to save you, and you get introduced to the health bar mechanic, which is just wiping your groin and seeing how many fingers get wet. Yeah I know, real familiar. Fortunately you can towel it off. The game also features some serious hardware in the form of hand grenades. You can use these to open doors, which might seem kind of boring, but it's actually part of a really genius mechanic that comes into play later. After blowing more stuff up, the Germans eventually decide to throw fart gas down at you, which is really disgusting, so I backed away. However, in order for the game to progress, you need to run into it and choke on it, so that way the Lambert guy from earlier can save you from it. It then cuts to this blurred sequence where the protagonist called Henry beats Lambert at a game of chance, and as a result Lambert has to go on patrol. You then find yourself above the trenches looking for Lambert who has fallen down a hole. Fortunately, you can give him some of that eldritch perp, and somehow manage to teleport him out of the hole. You then get spotted by some Germans who want to play street cleaning simulator with you, and it naturally ends in disaster. You then wake up in some kind of the bunker, suffering from some kind of amnesia. I find that inspecting pillows and throwing boxes can help with memory loss. But it didn't work this time. A note in the next room confirms that we are suffering from amnesia. And after that we are immediately thrown into the darkness of the bunker. Fortunately there is a beam of light pointing us toward a flashlight. However, this is no ordinary flashlight. It's a really terrible flashlight. It's loud and you have to constantly charge it by hand. It is really fun to play with though, and would be a great toy for children of all ages. Nearby is a picture of a dead guy which perfectly emulates the experience of browsing modern day Twitter. There is also a dead guy storage right next to it, which is great if you feel like a midnight stack. Quite quickly, it becomes apparent that this is the kind of place where you will get jumped by a monster. Fortunately, there is a beacon of sanctuary in the form of a man ruining his perfect health by having a smoke. It turns out that the bunker has been blocked off by a cave-in and we need to blow it up. The smoker tells us that he is going to a farm upstate, where he can play with all the other smokers, but he needs us to go into the other room to get his bus ticket. However, when we return, he tragically succumbs to lung cancer. We don't smoke, so we are fine. However, the lights suddenly went out, so I ran into the nearby food storage to look for a replacement light bulb. I wasn't scared or anything. After blowing open a nearby lock, the game game really opens up, because you finally find your way to the safe room. This is where the true amnesia the bunker begins. The main difference of this game when compared to the previous entries in the franchise is that it's actually a non-linear survival horror game. In the safe room is a map, and you can see a bunch of different areas that you will need to visit in order to complete the game. However, you can literally just visit these areas in any order and still make progress. It's not like other survival horror games, where there is 
actually a fairly linear route that takes you through the non-linear environment. This game randomizes elements such as the location of keys or tools, and it's done in a way where you will always find something of value no matter which area you decide to visit, which allows you to approach the game as a survival horror sandbox. Now that might just sound like a trip to Ikea, but the key difference is that everything is French, so it's scarier. The main goal of the game is to construct an IED to blow up a cave in so you can leave the bunker. Naturally, you need to go to all of the different departments of the Ikea to get all of the IED parts. Unfortunately, you cannot call any of the employees to help you, because they have been taken by the spectre of lung cancer we encountered earlier. Eager to escape this hellscape, you will leave the safe room and immediately realize that it is dark and scary. This is where the best mechanic in the game comes in. Inside the safe room is a generator. Turning it on will power the lights in the bunker. However, it does burn through fuel quite quickly. This means that you will always be on the lookout for more fuel. And because the French army was trying to save the environment, they turned off all of the lights which is before they died of lung cancer. So you will need to turn them all back on as you explore. You can also choose to take up one of your limited inventory slots with a noisy watch. This will tell you how much fuel you have left in the generator. For some reason, the manifestation of lung cancer that haunts the bunker does not enjoy the light. It tends to crawl around in holes when the lights are on, and usually you can hear it crawling around above or below you. However, in areas with the lights off, it will patrol around for your unsullied French lungs. And this game can get so dark that you can't see anything. Of course, you can use your flashlight, but that is so damn loud. Naturally, you will always want to keep the lights on, and for the most part on normal difficulty, that is achievable. However, occasionally you might be exploring a bit too far and a bit too long, causing the generator to run out of fuel. And now you are stranded on the other side of the IKEA from the checkout, and the lights are out which makes for an intense experience because you can only save your game at the safe room. So if you get caught by the monster that is now patrolling for your lungs, you will lose all the progress that you achieved in your most recent exploration. And it's an extremely tense experience. Now, if you do manage to keep the lights on, the monster basically isn't a threat. It might still try to ambush you, but for the most part, if you just don't make any loud noises, you will be safe. And that's where the second best mechanic of the game is found. In the pro log you are shown that you can break doors by throwing bricks at them, throwing black firebombs at them, and shooting red barrels next to them. At first this doesn't seem like a big deal because many immersive sim games already have features like this, but Amnesia the Bunker does something very funny with it. Many places in the game have locked doors. You can get past some of them by using a key, going through a crawl space, or using a special tool. However, a lot of them just cannot be opened. There is no special way to get around them. For example, every area has a map room near the start which is like this. The only way you can enter this room is by destroying this door, and every method of destroying the door is loud, which will attract the monster, even if you have the lights on. So in order to progress, you need to actively attract the monster to your location by doing a cheeky epic mail bomb prank compilation. Because that's when this couple stole a package from my porch. And even with the video footage, the police wouldn't do anything. So so I vowed to use my engineering skills to go full home alone on these punks. They're going to be terrified. Hello. Probably not gonna go try and get that box back. Because you are the one who triggers this engagement with the monster, you can also prepare yourself by hiding before the monster appears, or maybe using a barrel to set up a trap. After opening a few doors using these methods, I realized something. This game is basically just an adaptation of Tom and Jerry. You are a mouse running around this cat's house, and just blowing up all of its doors. Then when the cat marches out to whoop you, it can't find you because you are hiding in some random cupboard. The game also has a bit of Roadrunner in it, 
because the monster will literally hide and try to ambush you, causing you to sprint like a headless chicken setting off a bunch of trapped explosives that will backfire in his face. I would not be surprised if the next Amnesia game features a paint can that you can use to paint a fake road onto a wall or something. Going along with this whole cartoon theme that the game has going, there is actually a second enemy type that you can encounter throughout the game. Rats. They eat corpses. They will kind of just sit in your way munching on that good meat. The main way to deal with them is to light them on fire or scare them with fire. You can also just overcook their meal which will stop them from returning. They are quite a good addition to the game because it further enhances the Tom and Jerry connection. You are the Jerry to lung cancer's Tom and you are the Tom to the literal rats. As you continue to play the game you will also get more tools to use against the lung cancer monster to the point that you end up completely dominating it. So in a way you simultaneously become Tom and Jerry. You embody the hunter and the hunted and that's really the heart of this game. It's really human. You are this great destructive force that blows up doors and tunnels, that murders rats and shoots lung cancer monsters. But at the same time you run in fear of the rats, the explosions and the monster. The central area of the bunker is called Central Bunker. This is where the safe room and the exit of the bunker are located. But more importantly you can also find the locker room here. In real life, locker rooms are places where you go to inhale enough deodorant to give you permanent lung damage. I assume this is true of French World War 1 locker rooms too because you can find a gas mask in one of the lockers. This room is actually quite an important part of the game's progression. Each soldier has their locker code inscribed on their dog tag, so in order to unlock their locker, you need to find their corpse somewhere, most likely being chewed on by rats. There are also some key items that you need to progress in these lockers. The game randomizes some parts of the game such as trap locations and locked doors. The dog tags are part of this system. The codes are unique to each save file, so you have to find them in game and cannot just use an online guide. But more importantly, the locations of the codes are also randomized. This means that you will find the code for the gas mask on a different corpse in each playthrough. It's quite a smart way of handling it, because first time players will be able to get an idea of where the item they are looking for actually is, and returning players will still be able to engage with the scavenger hunt aspect of the survival horror. In order to open up the other areas of the game, you need to lift a lockdown, but when you try to, your big, meaty man hands break the valve, and the replacement is in a locker. Its code can be found nearby, but it requires you to enter the survival horror. There is a small area attached to the bottom of the central bunker. It's kind of like a parasitic tick nestled under the folds of its body. It's called Officer Quarters. This place is very dark and very scary. Fortunately, you can lock the weak and flimsy wooden doors. Previous Amnesia games have made use of this technology, but it was not as cool as it is in this game. You might remember it from the chase sequence in Dark Corners of the Earth. I've always wanted to see this used in an actual survival horror game, and Amnesia the Bunker finally delivers on this dream of mine. Easily a 10 out of 10 game for this feature alone. However, you can end up locking yourself in the same room as the monster. Fortunately for me, it just kind of sat in the hole and exhaled. Kind of like me with your mother last night. There are also some trapped and locked doors that you can blow up here if you care to. But at this point, it is so early in the game, you are still Jerry the Mouse. You have not ascended to the glory and bloodlust of Tom the Cat. So if you were like me, you were probably way too scared to risk attracting the monster to your location. It was very kind of frictional to allow you to access the valve code through a vent. I do wonder how many people actually opened any of the locked doors in this area though. With this code you can lift the lockdown and at this point you can pretty much access all of the areas in the game. The Resident Evil franchise has the iconic tool known as the bolt cutters. It's not really a Resident Evil game without some bolts to cut. We know that Amnesia canonically takes place in the same universe as Resident Evil because one of the items you can find is bolt cutters. However, in order to access them, you need to first First, find the less powerful but still fairly formidable wrench. It's located in the locker of Foreman Stafford, and this guy is the head of a place called Maintenance. His quarters can be found quite early on in the zone, however he isn't here. There is some random dead guy here. For me, he had a locker code that gave me the lighter. There is also a note here that tells us the Foreman tried to escape using the pillbox, which if you gain access to the map, can be found conveniently on the opposite side of the entire zone. When you enter the zone, you will find a single rat. 
It accidentally triggers a trap, showing us the best way to deal with rats. Most people when they have a rat problem will put some fuel into a bottle and use it to light the rat on fire. This naturally works in the bunker. To access the main part of the maintenance zone, you need to blow open a door which will attract the monster. Naturally, I just briskly walked away from the roars to the other end of the zone where I expected to find the foreman. This led to probably my favorite part of the entire game, and it's something that was entirely a result of the game's dynamic systems. The door to the pillbox is locked, and a nearby note reveals that the priest has the key. On the map is a room labeled as the chapel, and it's quite close by. It's at the end of an invite long hallway covered in blood, gore, and holes. This is definitely going to be safe. You are immediately greeted with this sight, and to make it even worse, you will get an achievement notification. The description says that you have discovered the beast's nest, so that's great. Naturally, I ran over to the confessional to hide. It seems like the priest had the same idea and left the key here. And of course, the sentient personification of lung cancer enters. It was at this moment I knew I made a mistake. Running through multiple explosive tripwires, I arrived at the pillbox and used the key, and climbed up the ladder to safety. Now I'm pretty sure the monster entering the chapel is a scripted event, but it's only a prelude to my favorite part of the game. You see, it's actually quite peaceful up here. You actually have some daylight, and the company of Foreman Stafford's corpse. There is some German guy taking shots at you, as well as any helmets you might hold up for him. I even saw the monster walking around at the bottom of the ladder like one of those aquariums with the glass bottom. It was so safe and peaceful that I spent nearly 10 whole minutes up there. Now here is where it got good. This whole time the generator was running, and as you would expect, it ran out of fuel, so the entire bunker was plunged into darkness. It had also been a while since I last saved, which meant I was at risk of losing all my progress, so I had to crawl all the way back through the zone and get back to the safe room. I didn't have to worry about running into any tripwires on the return trip, but it just so happens the monster patrols when it's dark, and the maintenance area has a single funnel point in the middle of the zone that I need to cross, and for some reason, the lung cancer decided to spawn on the opposite side of this funnel point, so I had to sneak around in the absolute pitch black darkness, and listen to its heavy emphysema breathing to avoid it. It was such an incredibly tense and memorable experience, and it only occurred because of the game's emergent systems. The bunker has an area that is basically just a dedicated German guy storage. When you first enter, you can hear some German guy whining for some reason. He has been left all alone as a result of the chaos of the bunker. It's quite sad. There is a pair of bolt cutters from Resident Evil next to him. I assume they are his favorite toy to play with, and that's why the guards left them with him. German guys love stuff like this. In order to free him and unlock him as a playable character, we can take the wrench we got from the foreman's locker and open a nearby grate. This lets us into the control room where we can do all sorts of fun stuff, like open all of the cell doors. And there's the spectre of lung cancer. The German guy will start screaming because he is going through a nicotine withdrawal. I assume the monster slapped too many of those patches onto him, because if you return, you can find the German on the ground. Fortunately, the bolt cutters were left behind. It's possible to lock yourself in here, at which point all you can do is just sit there. Kind of like the dedicated scared German guy. Which makes you think, isn't it kind of cyclical? Maybe the whole time we were the dedicated scared German guy, and he was us. With this Revelation, we can now use the bolt cutters for recreation just like he did. The main spot to use them is on this chained door in the arsenal. The next room might give you some flashbacks. There is actually a much stronger threat in this game, a box blocking a flooded tunnel. You cannot move it, probably because it's more buoyant than your mother. Through the miracles of modern engineering, we can just turn on a nearby pump to drain the water, and now we can progress through a tunnel, which leads to a warm light. You know it's about to get serious when you get hit with that second save point. Nearby is a hole that leads into some Roman ruins that were excavated during the construction of the bunker. Some mutineers started hallucinating as a result of the ruins 
phones and blew part of them up. They were arrested and dealt with, but it turns out, in a moment of absolute genius, at no point did anyone retrieve any of the stuff they used in the sabotage, which means the handle we need to trigger the explosives at the exit of the bunker is just sitting down here in these dark and scary ruins. The ruins are filled with fart gas fumes. This might lead you to believe that the lung cancer monster would lurk down here, on account of the potential lung damage caused by said fart gas fumes. But it's actually impossible for it to come down here, because you see, there is a far more dangerous monster, your fellow man. One of the mutineers hid down here and cut out his own eyes because he watched the Paragon seizure episode. Therefore, he can only detect you by hearing you. So you have to be quiet. I wasn't. I assume there was probably some fleshed out system where you could distract him by throwing items or something. But like a true American, I had no time for that. It turns out he was using a gun that is longer than yours. This gun is great at destroying doors. And the handle you need is behind a door. Violence literally solves every problem. Once you get the handle, you might notice a hole in the wall nearby. This leads outside and into a bigger hole. The same hole from the start of the game, rich with the resplendent rivers of that eldritch perp. You can find the dog tag of your friend who saved you at the start of the game, as well as a toy in a pool of blood. This might seem boring because Paddington is cooler than Peter Rabbit. Like seriously, look at him. Boy is weak. Paddington could probably bench like 5 kilograms easy. No challenge. Probably max out at 7 kilograms, no challenge. However, unlike Paddington, this boring toy can be used to kill people. That comes later though. You might recognize the Eldritch Perp drink from the previous Amnesia game, which will be important later. For now, however, you can head back into the ruins and immediately get jump scared by hordes of ghouls. They are spiritual manifestations of the fart gas and can't actually harm you. The developers were laughing at you when they put that one in. Fortunately, you never need to come back to this horrible hole. The the last area I conquered in the game was the soldier quarters. This is the deepest area of the bunker. There are a lot of beds down here. If you aren't familiar with beds, people use them to sleep. So naturally, you can find a lot of their personal belongings around their beds, which can include notes. You can even find your own bed, but you can't sleep in it because it is dirty and probably has bed bugs. The main goal for this area is to access the communications room. One of the officers who escaped the bunker intends on broadcasting the codes we need to access the arsenal. He could have just written them down, but then we wouldn't have any reason to come down here. So it's nice that he wants us to experience walking through a dark and scary place that is filled with beds. The key needed to open the communications room door is naturally behind a locked door. I did not want to attract the monster, so I tried to burn the wooden door, but it did not work. I also accidentally set off the fart gas canister, which I choked to death on. So that was fun. Eventually, I managed to throw a grenade at it and hide under a table. What's great is that it turns out the key isn't actually in here, and some guy just decided to hide a copy of it in his bunk for some reason. For me, his bunk was right next to the door, so I choked to death on fart gas twice and the whole time the key was a meter away. Anyway, no harm done, because at least I had the key. It turns out the communications room has no power, and it just so happens that the power is routed through a nearby blocked off room. The only way to access this room is to navigate around the edge of the entire zone. Let me remind you that the officer could have literally just written down the arsenal access codes. He said he would broadcast the codes in order to help us. Anyway, rats are cool right? They are like giant bed bugs. It can cost a lot of money to pay some guy to make you a bunch of firebombs. The same is true about making DIY firebombs in this game. The good news is that you can also light a stick on fire and wave it at them. This is more cost effective, but it doesn't permanently remove them from the area. Its light can also reveal some things that are better left unseen. Some dead guy forgot to turn off his mixtape before he decided to die. The beat is hard, in the kind of way that guides the player towards its location in order to progress through their primary objective. Just behind it is a locked door that you can recreationally cut open. Inside is the final switch. Finally, we can get the code for the arsenal. Once you return to the radio room, all you need to do is press this button. To anyone left, the code is two, four, two, one. 
Yeah, that is literally it. He could have written it down. He had time to write all of this, but not four digits. I hope that you can forgive me. The setup isn't even mic'd up, so you can't speak ill of his mother. The arsenal is easily the smallest area in the game. You can't really do much here until you get the code. But now that we have it, the fun can begin. You see, in order to get the explosives you need, you must traverse a massive dark warehouse. There are plenty of traps and obstacles you need to push out of the way. Some rats have also taken up residence. However, as you would expect from such a maze, the monster will show up. And so now you need to pry off wooden boards and arrange platforms to jump off, while this guy is trying to sniff out your tar-stained lungs. It's an extremely tense experience, but fortunately once you get through it, you can grab the dynamite that you need and immediately realize that there is no shortcut back. You will need to traverse the entire warehouse again. This is the ultimate frictional games troll move. I managed to stealth my way back to the beginning, but set off a tripwire trap that I had forgotten about right as I got to the exit. So I just kinda kept walking and pretended that nothing happened, until I realized that something had happened. Now that you have all of the ingredients, you can finally bake your IED. Of course this makes a loud sound, so in fear of lung cancer, you will immediately run forward and jump into the hole you just opened up. However, the whole point of this exercise was to blow open the entrance of the bunker, not to blow open a hole in front of the entrance of the bunker. So I guess you're now in an ancient tunnel system and the lung cancer is down here. Great! In a turn of luck, the tunnel exits into the ruins of an ancient extra dimension civilization, so I guess that's convenient. It's at this point the final boss fight starts. What's funny about it though is that you won't even realize it. The cave is really dark but the occasional flicker of a mystical eldritch perp drink will light it up. And if you are observant you might notice a guy just kinda crawling around slowly. This guy is the guy. You know, the scary guy. The goal is to hurt him bad because he is mean. The bridges around the arena can be retracted to block his path and there are a bunch of makeshift wooden ones. You obviously have to blow up the wooden bridges while he is on one, right? I may have failed to do that. However, he ended up getting stuck on some geometry in the process, so I just kinda shot him a few times and left him alone like I was some kind of officer of the law. The real solution to this fight just requires you to stack some boxes and jump over a wall. This finally leads to the surface. You slide down a cliff and into a pile of French corpses. If you fail to eliminate the lung cancer, he will show up and throw a tantrum. However, the true horror soon arrives. German people who are really into simulator video games for some reason. There is a cool way to take out the monster and get a slightly different ending, but in order to understand that, we need to take a look at the true identity of the monster. As the game has already established, the protagonist has amnesia and they are in the bunker. But before they got amnesia and woke up in the bunker, you might recall there was that random guy we fought fed Eldritch drank to. The very same guy that saved us from the fart gas and the farming simulators. When you go down into the fart gas tunnels to get the part required for the IED, you can go back to the hole where you found him and get a closer look at the drink you gave to him. It might look familiar to some of you. It's the same kind of stuff that was found in the previous Amnesia game. In that game, the enemies you came across were the protagonist's former allies. Their plane crashed in the desert. They eventually found their way to an oasis where an evil interdimensional emperor said to the protagonist, I'm like, hey, can I have your child in return for saving your life? Then the protagonist said, nah. So the evil interdimensional empress poisoned the water with the eldritch perp drink, which turned all who drank from it into monsters. It's basically the same kind of drink here. Henry was assigned to scouting duty. However, he gambled with his friend Lambert over who should go. Henry must go. Who must go? And Henry used loaded dice so he would win. You can even find these in his locker. Lambert then failed to return from scouting, so Henry felt like he killed his best friend and went out looking for him. Fortunately, he found him, and unfortunately, he gave him that eldritch perp. This quickly healed Lambert's wounds, and he managed to save both of them from the farming simulators. However, this close call gave Henry amnesia, and he woke up in the bunker. In the meantime, while Henry was in the infirmary, Lambert slowly 
slowly started turning into the manifestation of lung cancer and killed many of his comrades. By the time Henry woke up in the bunker with amnesia, Lambert had fully become one with the lung cancer. This is a truly sad story, but it only elevates to prepare to cry when you return to the Eldritch Perp Hole. You see, Lambert accidentally left behind a rabbit toy he meant to give to his son when he returned from the war. Of course, he can't do that now, but if you pick it up you can return it to him. It will distract him, showing that there is still some humanity left within him. That is the true prepare to cry. Now it's time for the prepare to die. We can actually use this sad, tragic moment as a weapon. The toy can be recollected from his den in the church. And if you take it to the final battle, you can place it on a bridge and send him tumbling down. That's the real Sigma grind set. Learn the emotional vulnerabilities of your closest allies so you can exploit them when they turn into demonic extra dimensional beasts. If you do this, you get basically the same ending, only this time there is no monster. But you still get jumped by the truck simulators. There is also one more small detail. If you jump down the pit in the final fight, there is a familiar sight. It's the shadow from the earlier games. The shadow is basically this cancerous growth that chases the guy from the first game because he touched some balls or something. No ball touching has actually occurred in the bunker that we know of. So it's hard to say exactly why the shadow is here. Amnesia the Bunker is an amazing survival horror game. It's a true sandbox experience that is rare when it comes to the genre. It perfectly executes on pretty much everything it sets out to do. For example, the game is called Amnesia the Bunker. And in the game, you have amnesia in a The Bunker. You truly are suffering from brain damage. And that's great. But what's also great is that you can blow up doors and throw dolls at monsters or even turn lights on and off. Turn Turning lights on and off is really fun in real life, and just like in Amnesia the Bunker, the shadow people come out when it's dark. The game leaves you wanting more. It's a bit on the shorter side, but I think that works quite well with how replayable it is. So it's hard to criticize that aspect of it. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the developers make next. Because this feels like it was just a small prelude to something greater. I know I mispronounced the names of the characters. I know it's like Henri or Lambert or something. But I felt that I should avoid pronouncing them like that. Because France is really scary. If you enjoyed this video, you should subscribe to my channel. It would look great on your resume.